Zola. I'm out here hooking because your ass can't stay clean and all you can do is think about your old snot-nosed ass girlfriend? Well, fine. Take your sorry, junky, stank ass and get on out of here. Because you don't want shit, you ain't got shit, and you ain't never gonna be shit. This movie was not about Frankie Lyman. Welcome back to my channel. It's Tyra here with another struggle review here to discuss why do fools fall in love. Now this movie stars Lorenz Tate and it's from 1998. Now before I get into all things Frankie Lyman and the teenagers, I need you guys to drop down and subscribe to my channel and like this video. I'm going to give you guys a moment to do that and then we're going to come back and discuss. Oh, we're going to discuss the real story, not the story they gave us in the movie. I'm talking about the real Frankie, the 12 and 13 year old Frankie that was out here sleeping with grown ass women. That one, but we gonna get to it today. Go back, 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 back. subscribe to see more of me let's get into this video but before we jump into the movie i have to give a shout out to the person who paid for it and requested this in the first place so if you happen to get your goody goody why do fools fall in love out in the cold again ass life it's not because of me it's because of this person right here thank you so much for supporting me and paying for this content now, getting into this movie, this movie was directed by Gregory Nava. He did some assistant directing on movies like Frita. He directed movies like My Family. And right before this movie, he directed Salinas. Now, if you go back and watch this movie and watch Selena, you can totally see the comparison in certain shots, filters that are being used. It is very influential on why the fools fall in love. This movie was also written by Tina Andrews. She did not have a lot of background as far as directing beyond a miniseries, but she did do some acting in the 70s. But as far as writing for an actual movie, no. And it definitely shows here. The movie depicts a very dramatized version of Frankie Lyman's life in the teenagers. We follow him all the way up to stardom. We follow him through the underhanded workings of the music industry, drug addiction, his three failed marriages to three different women who couldn't be more different, who are left to now fight over his remaining estate. Now, if there was ever a person who already has a biopic that I would want them to get their just due and get another one, what? it would be Frankie Lyman. For him to have been as young as he was and have had the short run that he did have as a solo artist or even the career that he had with the teenagers as a group, he is a very influential figure as far as rock and roll, as far as groups, boy bands, child stars the group set a president to be the first to do a whole lot of things that were you know marketed rinsed and repeated for other groups that they were also really influential on and that's not even including him as an individual as a singer as a dancer you see a lot of him and artists like michael jackson raf Tresvan, the jackson five to market young child stars coming up after. And they showed that young kids could be just as successful. They could chart. Maybe we should do more of that. And then you have Frankie Lyman really being that first young black child star prodigy. He had such a strong voice. He had charisma. He was a really great dancer. And you felt like he had so much more to come. Is that reflected in this film? 
Not exactly. This is very much so a classic film and we love it, but in watching this movie and watching the actors, if you don't know anything about Frankie Lyman, nobody's assuming that all of this passion, the dancing, the songs are coming from a 11, 12, 13 year old boy and a group that wasn't much older. They are very much so, especially Frankie Lyman, a cautionary tale as far as the music business is concerned. We have seen the cycle of where his career went in such a short time with him being so young, repeated with people a lot older, you know, people being taken advantage of, leaning more into drugs, kids not being protected. This is such like, this is need to know news because a lot of the stuff in this film, as far as just the music industry as a whole, these things are still in place till today. Like, ugh. Give Frankie his just due, give him a real movie. Now this movie is so much so not about Frankie Lyman that we don't even start with him. We don't even see a Frankie until we're damn near 10, 12 minutes into the film. We begin with Vivica Fox here portraying Elizabeth Waters and she's locked up in jail thinking if Diana Ross has a hit with Why Do Fools Fall In Love, who's collecting the money? It should be me, I'm his wife. Mickey has clearly had a hard not life of petty crime and is looking forward to getting paid because I'm Mrs. Frankie Lyman. The only problem is, so is Amara Eagle and so is Miss Zola Taylor. It's bad enough I have to deal with this nylon wig wearing bitch. Now I have to deal with your country apple ass too. I'm Mrs. Frankie Lyman. This movie focuses so much on the women. They literally make Frankie Lyman a background character in his own movie. The women are so vibrant, so funny, and so freaking present in the forefront of the movie. They couldn't be more different. Clearly Frankie Lyman ass was out here marrying everybody, but who is going to get and deserves the money from his estate? I don't know. Let's go to court. Now, this has to be one of the most dramatized and fictional depictions of, you know, somebody's bio that you would ever want to see because they tweak so much and get so far away from the truth. Real moments where the truth was most likely better than the fiction that they are giving us here. Why? <laughs> She never heard a song on the radio. The ladies never, you know, geared up to go to court or march into Morris's office. This was all the teenagers. Like everybody just said, fuck the teenagers. The teenagers were the ones trying to go and collect money. Like Diana Ross, all of these people are remaking our song. It's been, you know, used in commercials. We actually wrote on it. We should be collecting some of that. But Morris found these women and offered them way less, maybe 20, 30K to come and claim Frankie's estate just so he wouldn't have to go to court and maybe have to pay out those damn teenagers. But you know, we don't wanna see that. We rather focus on the women. Now, for whatever reason in the movie, the women's storylines are way more executed and elevated as far as their arcs, their personalities, getting to know them, liking certain things about them. It's executed at a higher level than actually Frankie Lyman. I feel like we get to spend more time with them, even when we have brief moments in courts, you know, all the one-liners, all the back and forths. And then when we finally meet Frankie Lyman, it's a quick, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, it's boom, we're superstars. <laughs> it was literally two minutes, boom, we got a gold record. Everything was moving oh so fast. Now what the movie did get right here was casting Lorenz Tate as Frankie Lyman. It is absolutely perfection, not only for the mannerism, but his small stature. Now, even though Lorenz Tate is delivering a top tier performance in this movie, a part of me would love to see actual teens in this role because Frankie Lyman was a teenager. Outside of the career aspect, because the movie goes so fast and they just don't show us these things i would absolutely love to see that gap from him being freaking four all the way up to him even joining the teenagers because it's a good depiction of boys growing up too fast and just not being protected at all he was subjected to so much stuff you know positive stuff like you know trying to help out around the house and getting a job at eight and nine years old 
a fast talking, charming street kid who grew up really, really fast, is surrounded and partaking in prostitution, pimping out girls, hustling, and sleeping with women at nine and 10 who are 25 and 20. What? What the hell is that? Like smoking weed, acting out. Like we had been on some shit long before the group, long before the teenagers, long before the heroin. It is so heartbreaking that nobody was there to protect this little boy. And I don't think that boys being exposed to sex way too early by older women is discussed enough. I would love to see that put to film. <sighs> the movie is really fast paced and really flashy and we just choose not to focus on those things, but not even so much, you know, his childhood, even when we get into them directly shooting up to stardom, going on tour, we have a gold record. Woo child, we on tour with Lil Richard and Zola Taylor. No, it is so fast. We didn't even put a real good enough stamp, in my opinion, on these young teens and Frankie Lyman writing most of these songs. Like, it is just really amazing to me how the industry all, all around, just the entertainment industry as a whole can repeat things so often and it goes unnoticed and we still have artists specifically black artists getting caught up in the same cycle of being taken advantage of being used signing contracts no lawyers present no parents parents just you know allowing their kids to go and be whisked away and later they you know wind up with nothing now child after i came out of the rabbit hole and got back into the movie we have little richard here being little richard stole my wop baba loo bop wop bam boom yes honey morris stole the money he ain't even used no vaseline sola Hey, baby, like, hey! <laughs> Little Rich would always be a moment. I remember as a kid just thinking that it was Little Richard antics that he would go, you know, I am the architect, I am the originator, I am the, I am everything, like, but no, he literally was and never got any acknowledgement for it. So I love seeing him here in this movie. But Zola Taylor here, and she's portrayed by Holly Berry, like, this is maybe the most beautiful that I felt like she looked. I mean, she's gorgeous, but it's just something about that particular color hair. It's just, look, really flattering on her but Zola Taylor is here as the first woman of the platters and she's also the first of the bunch to just become completely smitten with little Frankie Lyman him as a performer she tries to put up a fight at first but she eventually falls for him and they embark on this wonderful glamorized relationship mind you actual Zola was probably what 20 and little Frankie Lyman is about 13 at the time but you know we just gonna leave that on the ground Right along with Frankie being so conditioned to sleep with older women, he didn't want to hit nobody under the age of 25 years old, taking grown ass women on tour and disguising them as his mother. Yeah. Like, this is the movie, this is the moment, but this is, you know, what we chose to focus on in this particular movie. Not the fact that this group was being completely taken advantage of as children. They got no money from that tour, had no money on that tour, and ended up being completely flat broke. Not the fact that they were grooming him and pumping his ego up so much from when he was a kid all the way to maybe being 13 or 14 that he was super duper arrogant, like had a really poor attitude. Like they really depict him as being like an innocent little lamb at first. Like, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Like, no, he absolutely knew that he was going to go solo and actually was for them pushing him to the front. But what else are we supposed to know as a 12 and 13 year old when somebody is pumping our heads up saying, you're the star, you don't need them. And on this B side of this record, we're just gonna put your song out. So you met someone who set you back off your heels. Goody, goody. So you met someone and now you know how it feels. Goody, goody. And we did never have a goody, goody song after that one. Everybody is not meant to go solo. We have heard this story so many times where they prop up the lead singer and they think that this is gonna be a Beyonce, a Diana Ross, a Michael Jackson situation where they go off and flourish. And once you don't and your records don't pop, you're completely thrown away. There aren't a lot of Beyonce's, but there are a lot of Tony Thompson's like oh like I just really want him to get his just do in a real movie don't give me oh Zola I didn't know it was gonna go down like this Morris is just so so chicken shit 
Well, Frankie, he's a chicken shit kind of guy, but it's okay. You're the star. You're the people that came to see. And he goes on up to Zola's room and she has to instruct him how to take it slow and no, remove the bra first. Like he is just such a innocent boy. Was he an innocent young boy? Hell yeah, but was he arrogant? Was he a little selfish? Was he really mannish and hitting everything that was moving? And being introduced to drugs in the first place by a much older woman at 14? Yeah, we want to see that. But that's not what's depicted here. We literally have Frankie just take a leap. Oh, his career was on a downslide. And then all of a sudden he is just constantly shooting up. We're not going full circle to show his life and why and how he even got there. Imagine being a teenage boy who grew up way too fast, had this amazing talent, is taken advantage of, is promised the world, is touring, and is absolutely left with nothing after his first record doesn't hit and now he's on drugs courtesy of an older woman introducing him to the drugs and now your entire career and you as a person you're considered blackballed and washed at 15 16 17 years old your life is over what but that's okay i will take all the inconsistencies that come along with this film and come back just for one person in particular goddamn vivica a fox she carries this whole freaking movie from start to finish. People tend to forget because they only see the Vivica Fox now, the whole Fox Soul situation. This is 90s Vivica when she was in her bag. Booty call Vivica, Independence Day Vivica, set it off sold full Vivica like when she was outside, she was outside. And I don't think she ever got enough credit for not only her acting talents, but just her comedic timing. She is fucking funny in this role. Frankie is no longer flourishing as a solo artist and he is just simply getting by. He meets Mickey, of course, stealing, cause it's a summer dog. Some of this, some of that. That's your friend. She thought she had hit a lick. She thought she had came up. Why me? I'm not Zola. I'm just plain old Mickey. Completely ignoring all the red flags to get the hell away from Frankie. By this point in his life, he is a full-blown junkie. Now, if it makes any more sense, of course, their depiction in the film, they look a whole lot older. But at the time, I believe Frankie was maybe 17, 18, and she was maybe 20. So, you know, they still have some growing to do. But child, she invites Frankie into her life and it just all falls apart and it's a hot ass mess. I love me some Paula Jai Parker. Yeah, I love packing that bad boy up four flights of stairs. Just so you and your junkie ass boyfriend can live comfy cozy. Who do you think you're talking to? I know what it look like. I'm from the streets. That boy got a $10 a day habit. When the last time he had a hit song? I got a record player. I ain't heard no records. <laughs> If they hadn't a completely glossed over Frankie's childhood and we got to see some of his interactions with those older women, we could totally see how he, cause this was, this was a finesse ass situation. All of that attachment and that hold that he had over somebody like Mickey to continue to, you know, even though she loved him to stick by his side, deal with his addiction and also somebody on the level of maybe Zola, have him, you know, occupy her empty apartment, have him take her mink and give it to Mickey you gonna always be tied to me. Have, you know, that hold over Zola enough for her to later on invite him out to her house and all these other good things. The whole switch up that he had with Myra. Frankie was a different person for every single different woman, whoever he needed to be at that time. I low key feel like he was a little manipulator and he was a troubled person how he was brought up and then later getting that fame and feeling really entitled. And we coming with all the, I'll always want you because my heart is true. Come to come to come closer and I'll tell you all the ABCs. Don't let him tell you no ABCs. Hide your kids, hide your wife, hide your purse. Frankie Lyman is coming down the street. Like absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not entitlement, playing the blame game because he was brought up to know nothing else. This boy, this young man was absolutely never protected, never saved by anyone. All I know is being a performer, being Frankie Lyman, and if I'm not that, then I'm a nobody. And that's, you know, pushing me further and further into using these drugs and blaming my problems in my life on the women that I am with. You the reason I can't stay off the motherfucking dime. Like, oh, where that money I gave you the whole, like, damn. <laughs>
Anybody deserved that money, it was Elizabeth. She was with him when he was at the bottom at his worst. Like, oh my God, what that money I gave? Frankie, you ain't gave me no money the whole. Like throwing, destroying shit with him in the worst of his addiction. Now the movie did not shine a whole lot of light on the moments where he did try to get clean because he did try, but he just wasn't really successful all the time. But child, when he tells her, I don't need this shit and I don't need you. And he runs his happy ass out the door and comes back. It, I'm gonna I'm a laugh. I'm gonna die every single time he comes back. I'm gonna kill you, Frankie. I need my money, Frankie. And this motherfucker's trying to lock the door. And oh, shit. It's <laughs> that, it's not, you know, funny subject matter, but him trying to lock the fucking door because he didn't clearly burn somebody saying he's gonna pay, he's gonna pay to this dealer to, you know, feed his habit. And he has yet to do that. And now they have came to collect and they are whooping his ass. Like him trying to lock that door will always make me laugh up the fucking street. Like, <laughs> why are you giving the mink? Why are you giving the mink? Well, you want me to let them kill you? Like, she saw him through so much. Little pretty, pretty one, come on and talk to me. Uh-uh, no, no thank you. <laughs> no thank you. Now they did tweet their story quite a bit. Me going back, you know, later on after you've watched the movie for so many years and then you get real information. The Summer Doll was absolutely a replacement for them actually losing their daughter. They had a whole kid. I was like, why would we put that in there? Maybe that just wasn't, you know, a good part of the storyline, but they did actually have a whole baby. He was sober. They were, you know, working on their relationship. He was, you know, maybe clean at this point and she had the baby, but it passed away a couple days later and this really affected him and pushed him back into addiction. By this time, he was blackballed because of his addiction. He couldn't, you know, get any gigs anywhere. They weren't making a whole lot of money, but they did, you know, put in her being previously married, her having a daughter already, but their whole daughter situation and, them kind of making it like okay the whole you know i can't take no more like get out frankie once he oh she bit me like oh oh that is probably the most memorable scene in the whole movie when he dangles that damn dog out of the window get on your knees like that's probably the most uh scene to really display how uh manipulating he was and how arrogant he was as a person to you know even do some actions like that all of the get on your knees do you know who i am that whole situation but that was definitely the breakdown i can't take them more of their relationship when in reality it was actually them losing their baby girl now even though i always thought the movie slowed down a bit once we leave his relationship with mickey i always really appreciated the fact that the movie reflects it on how even though these women were older and they've had other life experiences the situations that they went through with frankie you know hanging the dog out of the window and him you know taking the, the house situation with zola it was still very much affecting them to this day and you know it's just about you know dealing with that trauma speaking of the house like never to you know disrespect anybody who has a habit but you literally left your house <laughs> in a check in the hands of an addict now of course at this point we have frankie he has cleaned up but with the movie being so inconsistent you know with the real life story if they could have shown that he had multiple relapses by this time like he he was never in a good state to be sober for long periods periods of time until you know later on those last uh couple of years when he was with amira so you literally left your house in a check with a with a, with a junkie are you watching fucking mind? Like, <laughs> I always thought, you know, that was crazy. But, you know, we have her try to get Frankie, you know, back on his feet and help him out and invite him into the house and the whole thing with the husband. I don't know how accurate her story is because both of them have gone on record to say it was never really that deep for either one of us. This was more of a publicity relationship set up by the label. And like, yeah, it had to be some girl because you left your keys in the hand of this man and you came back to nothing. Now we do have the glamorized funny Sally ain't got no hair Sally ain't got no hair like talk about the ABCs <laughs> that, that little dude over there for all the five seconds only you like this is hilarious you know them giving their different depictions of what happened when Vivica old Mickey rolled up to the house and she wearing my shit bitch I will whoop your ass 
you know, we have to bring in that dramatization, but I would love to get an actual real life story because it's very um, disheartening when Zola returns to absolutely nothing and she has to start over. But you put the check and the keys in his hands, ma'am. So who who's the problem here? Now, out of all the stories and the, the marriage and we got this, you know, everybody's marriage. Well, outside of Amara's, it has, you know, an inconsistency. You have Mickey, she was still married, but you know, Zola's whole Cali Mexico and the foot and the dock thing and then we went up the hill and then we got married. It, it, it never it never flowed right. It always felt like a lie. They should have gave all the shmoney, all the shmoney and life to Elizabeth. But all jokes aside, they all had their own personal experiences with Frankie Lyman and all deserve like the world because oh my goodness. But after we leave Zola picking up the pieces of her life, we end off the movie getting to know Amara. Now, Amara Eagle situation, I always felt like we left the movie and went somewhere else. And I think that was the idea, like gardening, poetry, Frankie wouldn't know a him if it hit him in the head. Like <laughs> the fact that he was all of these different men to, you know, these three different women. We go over, you know, this holier than thou threshold. I know Frankie was with me and he was with Zola, but not this down home ass school mom. I am a down home school mom. Like I have my degree degree on a degree of a degree degree degree. Did I say I had my degree? Like, oh, uh, I was with Vivica. Like, oh, okay, girl. <laughs> but Amara just seems like absolutely perfection. She, you know, lives down south. She's like she said, a school mom. She's a teacher. She cares about kids. She can cook. She's into gardening. She's just so fluffy and wholesome. I even think we have, you know, them courting and dating the poetry. And him, from the looks of it, taking her virginity after marriage, like, girl, Mara, no. There isn't a whole lot of storyline once we get to the end of the movie. So when we have things like him going to the army, meeting Amara, and he's AWOL and all these other good things, they seem really, really rushed. But we didn't get into, you know, him relapsing, him trying to be clean, him going to jail and all these other things because of his addiction and him stealing from people that he eventually has to go to the army. But he had never actually dealt with his addiction all on his own, you know, the past child childhood trauma and really dealt with what it means to not be a star. His ultimate goal was to always get back to where he was, be sober, have his name in lights. I want that fame that I once had. I want people to care about my voice. But on top of, you know, being blackballed in the drugs and popping at 15, he also had that voice change that just made everything just so unrecognizable. And how are we gonna work with this? This is just so different. People were ready to throw him away because he didn't still sound like an 11 year old kid. But he did eventually get a new manager. He was sober. He did make songs. Has an actual lovely tone as an adult, you know, performer. And the movie did not include any of that. You just literally have him roll over and, you know, I would just catch Frankie in a, in a space that I knew my love couldn't feel. Like, no, this man was really out here trying to make money moves. <laughs> they just threw that all away for the, Frankie Lyman, is that you? Oh man, sign here, I thought you was dead. Like, damn. <laughs> So you have him just being so eager and clamoring for that spotlight enough to just leave Amara, leave, you know, their beautiful life to go to New York and have Morris. You're a bum. You're a has-been. See, this is what I'm talking about. Doo-wop is dead. But -da -da -da. Jimmy took it somewhere else. Your mama ain't shit. Your daddy ain't shit. Your babies ain't shit. They're never gonna be shit. Get the fuck out of my office. Like, we, we didn't have to go that route. <laughs> Not to say that any of those things didn't happen, but because he did have his moments in his career where he was practically begging people to put him on, give me a gig, and he wasn't quite clean. But at that particular moment in his life, that was not the case. But in the depiction in the film, he is just really feeling let down at his prospects of a career. He feels like it has been. You know, we have, I love how we have Zola. And fill my heart with love for a Like you can't see that nigga way back there. <laughs> I hope lay you. Oh Lord, it's Frankie, I'm about to cry. And he just cannot take it anymore at which he sees the same drug dealer. And he has, you know, that last hit that takes him out and he dies in his grandmother's bathroom. That is not all that happened. He was, you know, trying to make a comeback. He was sober. Somebody did believe in him enough to give him a record deal again, you know, help him clean himself up, get, you know, a manager, get him some gigs to perform, lay down some tracks. It wasn't just the end all to be all. And then there was all
always, you know, some spookiness surrounding his death because the manager that he had at the time had close ties and a friendship with Morris. So maybe this could have been, you know, he's worth more dead than alive situation. And they took him out to just profit on his music altogether. We will never know, but we definitely wasn't going to get that shit in this movie. Now we don't end off the movie on a super sour note with Frankie's death. We do have the women connecting more so Elizabeth trying to get in where she fit in, you know, 50% of something is better than 100% of nothing. And you know, you give me half, if you win, we spit a 55th and a 33rd. Sounds illegal, it sounds illegal. Like, <laughs> but you have the women bond and realize, you know, hey, despite everything, we all had experience with this man. I absolutely love Vivica Fox as Elizabeth and that whole goddamn conversation. And goddamn, <laughs> Holly Berry goes, I don't know what I ever saw in that little fucking flat foot ass weirdo. Well, I don't know, but you know what? The boy could fuck you. Yeah, he was a good lady. Like, <laughs> come on, Myra. You know you got that rocker Travolta. Like, you know you got that thing, girl. Don't, don't fucking play. Don't be holy over there sipping on your strong ass Long Island iced tea. Like, I absolutely love those moments in the film. And even in the end, you know, when it gets really dramatized, when they actually award the estate and the money to Elizabeth and she tells them where the fuck to go. Like, I gotta go, bye bye. What you Jerry Curl wearing? Ghetto ass bitch, I will whoop your ass. And like, oh yeah, Myra came all about her body. Like all that church spirit left real, real quick. <laughs> But that's pretty much where we end up with the movie and there's, you know, talk of Amara going to court yet again. But the tee hee 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 he is like, oh, Vivica was all in her oats in this fucking role. And I will love it absolutely for that. But I really, really would go up for a real life depiction of a real Frankie Lyman movie. But you know, we love why do fools fall in love also all the fools well you guys that was my review for why do fools fall in love i absolutely hope you enjoyed it i swear i didn't plan to make this video this long and go all down the rabbit hole and make a left and whatnot but i just felt like we needed to elaborate because they was trying to play him <laughs> but please drop down and tell me what you thought about this video did you learn anything new while watching it are you going to go back and look at why the fools fall in love a little sideways now i look forward to reading you guys comments thank you so much for supporting me and watching this video. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.